dlouhá. Něco se jako boje, že oni jsou Honolulu Hawaii. Once again, as per my custom, I will start and say hello to my audience. Today we're going to be reading some selections from a book called Of Anger or On Anger, Da Ira. <laughs> They're written by a, a Roman philosopher called Seneca, or perhaps Seneca the Younger. He lived approximately at the same time as Christ, and from about 4 BC to uh, 65 AD. Um, he was a writer, philosopher, Stoic. Full name was uh, Lucius Annius Seneca. Again, we're going to be reading some passages from his first book on anger. I'm going to take a, a moment and say hello to the good people who have been waiting in the audience. Hey, Model 316. Very good to see you again. Mortal V, or Mortal 5, I suppose. <laughs> good to see you in the Buzz CJC. Uh, so, I'm going to read a little bit from this from this book called On Anger, written by uh, Seneca. Let's uh, let's jump right into it and see if there's um, see if there's anything that resonates with us. I am going to skip around a little bit, but we'll, we'll start with the introduction. You have demanded of me. Novatus, that I should write how anger may be soothed. And it appears to me that you are right in feeling special fear of this passion, which is above all others hideous and wild. For the others have some alloy uh, of peace and quiet. But this consists wholly in action and the impulse of grief, raging with an utterly inhuman lust for arms, blood, and tortures, careless of itself, provided it hurts another, rushing upon the very point of the sword, and greedy for revenge, even when it drags the avenger to ruin with itself. Some of the wisest of men have a consequence of this called anger a short madness, for it is equal, equally devoid of self-control, regardless of decorum, forgetful of kinship, obstinately engrossed in whatever it begins to do, deaf to reason and advice, excited by trifling causes, awkward at perceiving what is true and just, and very like a falling rock which breaks itself to pieces upon the very thing which it crushes. That you may know that they whom anger possess are not sane, <laughs> look at their appearance. For as there are distinct sick symptoms which mark madmen, such as a bold and menacing air, a gloomy brow, a stern face, a hurried walk, restless hands, changed color, quick and strongly drawn breathing. The signs of angry men, too, are the same. Their eyes blaze and sparkle. Their whole face is a deep red with the blood which boils up from the bottom of their heart. Their lips quiver. Their teeth are set. Their hair bristles and stands on end. Their breath is labored and hissing. Their joints crack as they twist them about. They groan, bellow, and burst into scarcely intelligible talk. They often clap their hands together and stamp on the ground with their feet. Their whole body is highly strung. Plays those tricks which mark a distraught mind so as to furnish an ugly, and shocking picture of self-perversion and excitement. You cannot tell whether this vice is more 
execrable or more disgusting. Other vices can be concealed and cherished in secret. Anger shows itself openly and appears in the countenance. And the greater it is, the more plainly it boils forth. forth. Do you not see how in all animals certain signs appear? before they proceed to mischief <laughs> and how their entire bodies put off their usual quiet appearance and stir up their ferocity. Boars form at the mouth and sharpen their teeth by rubbing them against trees. Bulls toss their horns in the air and scatter the sand with blows of their feet. Lions growl the necks of enraged snakes swell. Mad dogs have a sullen look. There is no animal so hateful and venomous by nature that it does not, when seized by nature, show additional fierceness. I know well that the other passions can hardly be, can hardly be concealed and that lust, fear, and boldness give signs of their preference of their presence and may be discovered beforehand for there is no one of the stronger passions that does not affect the countenance what then is the difference between them and anger why that the other passions are visible but this this anger that is is conspicuous <laughs> That's the introduction. That is the introduction to Om Anger by Seneca. He's an interesting writer. He wrote uh, he wrote some dramas, some tragedies, and such. So he's uh, he's a bit more of a wordsmith, perhaps, than some of the other philosophers are. Even though he was uh, a Stoic, some of his language is a little bit more. Florid. <laughs> Let's see. Wait, right, this is section number two, still in book one of Anger. Next, if you choose to view its results and the mischief that it does, no plague has cost the human race more dear. You will see slaughterings and poisonings, accusations and counter accusation, sacking of cities, ruin of whole peoples, the persons of princes sold into slavery by auction, torches applied to roofs and fires, not merely confined within city walls, but making whole tracts of country glow with hostile flame. See the foundations of the most celebrated cities hardly now to be discerned. They were ruined by anger. See deserts extending for many miles without an inhabitant. They have been desolated by anger. See all the chiefs whom tradition mentions as instances of ill fate Anger stabbed one of them in the bed, struck down another, though he was protected by the sacred rights of hospitality, tore another to pieces in the very home of the laws and in sight of the crowded forum, bade one shed his own blood by the parasite hand of his son, another to have his royal throat cut by the hand of a slave another to stretch out his limbs on the cross, and hitherto, I am speaking merely of individual cases. What if you were to pass from the consideration of those single men against whom anger has broken out to view whole assemblies cut down by the sword? The people butchered by the soldiery let loose upon it, and whole nations condemned to death in one common ruin, as though by men who either freed themselves from our charge or despised our authority. 
Why wherefore is the people angry with gladiators and so unjust as to think itself wronged if they do not die cheerfully? It think itself scorned and by looks, gestures, and excitement turns itself from a mere spectator into an adversary. Everything of this sort is not anger, but the semblance of anger, like that of boys who want to beat the ground when they have fallen upon it, and who often do not even know why they are angry, but are merely angry without any reason or having received any injury, yet not without some sem semblance of the injury received or without some wish to exact a penalty for it. <laughs> Thus they are deceived by the likeness of blows and are, and are appeased by the pretended tears of those who deprecate their wrath. And thus an unreal grief is healed by an unreal revenge. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. Section 7. Section 7. May it not be, although anger be not natural, it may be right to adopt it because it often proves useful. It rouses the spirit and excites it. And courage does nothing grand in war without it, unless its flame be supplied from this source. This is the goad, the stick, <laughs> which stirs up bold men and sends them to encounter perils. Some, therefore, consider it to be best to control anger, not to banish it utterly, but to cut off its extravagances and force it to keep within useful bounds, so as to retain that part of it without which action will become languid and all strength and activity of mind will die away. <laughs> In the first place, it is easier to banish dangerous passions than it is to rule them. It, it, it is easier not to admit them than to keep them in order when admitted. For when they have established themselves in possession of the mind, they are more powerful than the lawful ruler and will in no ways permit themselves to be weakened or abridged. In the next place, reason herself who holds the reins is only strong while she remains apart from the passions. If she mixes and befouls herself with them, it's the passions, she becomes no longer able to restrain those whom she might once have cleared out of her path. For the mind, when once excited and shaken up, goes wherever the passions drive it. There are certain things whose beginnings lie in our own power, but which, when developed, drag us along by their own force and leave us no retreat. Those who have flung themselves over a precipice have no control over their movements, nor can they stop or slacken their pace, which once started, for their own headlong and irredeemable rashness has left no room for either reflection or remorse, and they cannot help going to lengths which they might have avoided. So also the mind, when it has abandoned itself to anger, love, or any other passion, is unable to check itself, its own weight, and the down, downward tendency of vices must needs carry the man off and hurl him into the lowest depths. I think we may just go ahead and read that passage again. It was, uh, it was quite something. Grand Theft Boyette going on out there. <laughs> is the entire 
Pancho Rodrigo Zamali asked, is the entire stream just an excuse for Edwin to show off the view from his balcony? Well, I figured I, I would give you gentlemen something interesting to look at besides my 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 mater, my melon, if you will. Let's see if I can give you a, a better view. How's that? Oh, there we go. So, just beginning to rain. We've got the clouds kind of rolling down the mountains there. They, um, they roll down the mountains. Roll down the mountains and kind of follow. The clouds kind of follow down these little valleys. And if you watch, watch carefully, you can kind of, kind of see them come. Well, there's just the hint of a rainbow. Let's see if I can capture that for you. It may be too faint. It be too faint to show up on the... Is it too faint? Yeah, it's a little bit too faint. I'm sorry. There's just a little bit of a, a hint of a rainbow out there, but I think the clouds are going to knock everything away. Let's see. Well, let's see if I can get my, my camera straightened out again. Who can make straight what a man has made crooked? <laughs> Come on now, camera. You got to be a team player. Got to be a team player, Kim. That's not quite right. There we go. There we go. All right. Hopefully, I didn't make anybody too drunk shifting that around, too motion sick. <laughs> yeah, that is the uh, that is the H1 freeway. That is the H1 freeway. Thankfully, I don't have to be out in that mess. I am. Um, we moved where we moved for a very specific reason. We're kind of centrally centrally located, and I can get on and off all the uh, all the all the freeways pretty easily, and not get stuck in traffic. All right, let's go back and read that last pa passage, because I, I felt like there was some profound stuff in there. May it not be, although anger be not natural, it may be right to adopt it, because it often proves useful. It rouses the spirit and excites it. And courage does nothing grand in war without it, unless its flame be supplied from this source. This is the goad which stirs up bold men and sends them to encounter perils. Some, therefore, consider it best to control anger, not to banish it utterly, but to cut off its extravagances and force it to keep within useful bounds so as to retain that part of it without which action will become languid and all strength and activity of mind will die away. In the first place, it is easier to banish dangerous passions than it is to rule them. It is easier not to admit them than to keep them in order once admitted. For when they have established themselves in possession of the mind, they are more powerful than the lawful ruler and will in no way permit themselves to be weakened or abridged. In the next place, reason herself, who holds the reins, is only strong while she remains apart from the passions. If she mixes and befouls herself with them, she becomes no longer able to restrain those whom she might once have cleared out of her path. For the mind, when once excited and shaken up, goes wherever the passions drive it. There are certain things whose beginnings lie within our own power, but which once developed or once begin once again, drag us along by their own force 
and leave us no retreat, right? There's no stopping this ride. <laughs> I want to get off. Too bad. It's too late. You're on the anger train. Those who have flung themselves over a precipice have no control over their movements, nor can they stop or slacken their pace when once started, for their own headlong and irredeemable rashness has left no room for either reflection or remorse, and they cannot help going to lengths which they might have avoided. So also the mind, when it has abandoned itself to anger, love, or any other passion, is unable to check itself. Its own weight and the downward tendency of vices must necessarily carry the man off and hurl him into the lowest depth. All right. This is section nine. In the next place, anger has nothing useful in itself and does not, does not rouse up the mind to warlike deeds. For a virtue, being self-sufficient, never needs the assistance of a, a vice. <laughs> uh, a vice as far as a, a negative a negative habit, right? Whether it needs an impetuous effort, it does not become angry, but rises to the occasion, and it excites or soothes as far as it deems requisite. Just as the machines which hurl darts may be twisted to a greater or lesser degree of tension, at the manager's pleasure. Anger, says Aristotle, is necessary, nor can any fight be won without it, unless it fills the mind and kindles up the spirit. It must, however, be made use of, not as a general, but as a soldier. There was a quote from Aristotle, and then Seneca returns, now this is untrue, for if it listens to reason, and follow whither, whither reason leads, it is no longer anger, whose characteristic is obstinacy. 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 We, we might also call that very stubborn, right? Obstinate is <laughs> very stubborn. <laughs> if again, it is disobedient and will not be quiet with, when ordered, but is carried away by its own willful and headstrong spirit it is then as useless an aid to the mind of a soldier who disregards the sounding of the retreat would be to a general. If therefore anger allows limits to be imposed upon it, it must be called by some other name and ceases to be anger, which I understand to be unbridled and unmanageable. <laughs> So here, Seneca is not talking about just some irritation or, or perhaps being slightly peeved. He's talking about anger, which he understands to be unbridled and unmanageable. And if it does not allow limits to be imposed upon it, it is harmful and not to be counted among aids. Wherefore, anger is not anger, for it is useless. For if any man demands the infliction of punishment, not because he is eager for the punishment itself, because it is right to inflict it, he ought not to be counted as an angry man. That will be the useful soldier who knows how to obey orders. The passions cannot obey any more than they can command. Section 10, for this cause, reason will never call to its aid blind and fierce impulses over whom she herself possesses no authority and which never can restrain, never can restrain 
safe by setting against them similar and equally powerful passions. As for example, fear against anger, anger against sloth, greed against timidity. <laughs> greed against timidity. May virtue never come to such a pass that reason should fly for aid to vices. <laughs> then too, reason ceases to have any power if she can do nothing without passion and begins to be equal and like unto passion. For what difference is there between them if passion without reason be as rash as reason without passion is helpless? They are both on the same level if one cannot exist without the other. Yet who could endure the passion that should be made equal to reason? Then says our adversary, passion is useful provided it be moderate. Nay, only if it be useful by nature. But if it be disobedient to authority and reason, all that we gain by moderation is that the less of it there is, the less harm it does. <laughs> Wherefore, a moderate passion is nothing but a moderate evil. Okay. <laughs> Boy, section number 13. Let me uh, let me stop by the chat for a moment while I wet my whistle. Let's see. Demonized says, so is adopted anger better than inherited anger? Burton says, controlled anger is is better than no anger or unbridled anger. I think what Seneca would tell you, Burton, is that uh, if the anger itself can be controlled, it is in fact not anger, or it is not anger for long. A moderate passion is... Oh, okay, let me go back and read that. And understand this is, this is coming at you from a, a Stoic's perspective, right? And this is Seneca... He is a bit more, he's a bit more um, florid than some of the other cynics, right? All right, so this was from section 10. You know, let me back up a couple sentences too. Okay. Uh, well, I can read the whole section again. It's short. Repetition never harmed us. All right, section 10. For this cause, reason will never call to its aid blind and fierce impulses over whom she herself possesses no authority in which she can never restrain save by setting against them similar and equally powerful passions. As for example, fear against anger, anger against sloth, Read against timidity, 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 be timid, or some might call that fearful of cowardice. Um, may virtue never come to such a pass that reason should fly for aid to vices. That reason should ever fly to aid for vices. The mind can find no safe repose there. It must needs be shaken and tempest tossed if it be safely because of its if it be safe only because of its own defects. Hmm. The mind can find no safe repose there. It must be shaken and tempest tossed if it is safe only because of its own defects, if it cannot be brave without anger, diligent without greed, quiet without fear, such is the despotism. If, if you prefer, you could also substitute the word tyranny there. Such is the tyranny under which a man must live if he becomes the slave of, 
of a passion. Are you not ashamed to put virtues? Are you not ashamed to put virtues under the patronage of vices? Then too, reason ceases to have any power if she can do nothing without passion and begins to be equal and like unto passion. For what difference is there between them if passion without reason be as rash as reason without passion is helpless? They are then both on the same level if one cannot exist without the other. Yet, who could endure that passion should be made equal to reason? Then says our adversary, <laughs> passion is useful, provided it be moderate. No, it is only useful by nature, only if it be useful by nature, only if it is useful by nature, but if it be if passion, if passion be dis disobedient to authority and reason, or if more specifically, if anger, if anger is disobedient to authority and reason, all that we gain by its moderation, right? What some of you perhaps were calling controlled or limited anger. But if it be disobedient to authority and reason, all that we gain, by its moderation, is that there's less of it. And the less harm it does. Therefore, we could call a moderate passion, and here, primarily speaking about anger, therefore, we could call moderate anger is nothing but a moderate evil. So its moderation does not turn it into a virtue, it is still a vice. <laughs> All right. Section 13. Moreover, qualities which we ought to possess become better and more desirable the more extensive they are. <laughs> Meaning the more of them we have. Okay. Moreover, qualities which we, we should possess become better and more desirable the more extensive they are. If justice is a good thing, no one will say it would be better if any part were subtracted from it. If bravery is a no, if bravery is a good thing, no one would wish it to be in any way curtailed. Consequently, <laughs> the greater anger is, greater anger is, the better it is. <laughs> For what if whoever objected to a good thing being increased? <laughs> but it is not expedient that anger should be increased. Therefore, it is not expedient that it should exist at all. For that which grows bad by increase cannot be a good thing. Hmm. Let's read that first section one more time. Sorry for the repetition. I just want to, sometimes I know when we run through some of these things, it is hard for them to sink in through, repeti through repetition. We can all be given a chance to uh, reconsider. All right. Moreover, qualities which we ought to possess become better and more desirable the more extensive they are. If justice is a good thing, no one will say it would be better if any part were subtracted from it. If bravery is a good thing, no one would wish it to be in any way curtailed. Consequently, the greater anger it, the greater anger is, the better it is for whoever objected to a good thing being increased. But it is not expedient that anger should be increased. Therefore, it is not expedient that it should exist at all. For that which grows bad by increase cannot be a good thing. Anger is useful, says our adversary, because it makes men more ready to fight. According to that mode of reasoning, then, 
drunkenness also is a good thing <laughs> for it makes men insolent and daring and many use their weapons better when the worse for wicked <laughs> nay according to that reason also you may call frenzy and madness essential to strength because madness often makes men stronger why does not fear often by the rule of contraries make men bolder and does not the terror of death rouse up even errant cowards to join battle <laughs> yet anger drunkenness fear and the like are base and temporary incitements to action and can furnish no arms to virtue which has no needs of vices although they may at times be of little assistance to sluggish and cowardly minds. <laughs> oh, let's catch that again. Yet anger, drunkenness, fear, and the like are base and temporary incitements to action and can furnish no arms to virtue, which has no need of vices. Although they may be of some little assistance to sluggish and cowardly minds. No man becomes braver, braver through anger, except one who without anger would not have been brave at all. Anger does not therefore come to assist courage, but to take its place. What are we to say to that argument that if anger were a good thing, it would attach itself to all the best men. Yet the most irascible of creatures are infants, old men, and sick people. Every weakling is naturally prone to complaint. <laughs> irascible, if you're not familiar with the word, uh, means easily angered. Oh man, I am digging Seneca. <laughs> I am digging Seneca. I've, I've never read this particular book by Seneca anymore. That's great. <laughs> we'll have to get, uh, give me one second. Let me wet my whistle and we'll hit that last section one more time because he's just, he's just tossing shade on the entire future. <laughs> Oh, boy, that's pretty good. All right. No man becomes braver through anger, except one who without anger would not have been brave at all. <laughs> you, you almost think Seneca would have put, like, wuss in parentheses right there. You wussy. Like... <laughs> <laughs> like he, he's he's trying to see who he can incite to anger uh, through his writing, just to prove himself right. Uh, no man becomes braver through anger, except one who, without anger, would not have been brave at all. Anger does not therefore come to assist courage, but to take its place. So it's a pale substitute. What are we to say to the argument? that if anger were a good thing, it would attach itself to all the best men, the very best men. Yet the most irrational, the most easily angered of all creatures are infants, old men, and sick people. <laughs> Every weakling is naturally prone to complaint. We should... Uh, <laughs> That should almost be like an auto reply in Twitter, right? If you're if you're on the social medias and you're uh, you're going at it with somebody and they're getting a little, let's see, is that too much? Let's see. Here we go. There you go. Yet the most irrational, irascible of creatures are infants, old men, and sick people. <laughs> Every weakling is naturally prone to complain. Hey, people of circus, sorry, I just ducked in. You have a good night, man. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. This the sky is actually lightened up some as we've been going here. Let's see if I can find that blue for you. Let's see if I can find that blue for you. Mm. Got him. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Just in this little, just in this little short time we've been talking, the uh, sun is trying to uh, poke its head through. Hey, Manny, how you doing? Manny is Manny is working on a, uh, and this is <laughs> a complete non sequitur. Manny is working on a uh, comic book project uh, called um, <laughs> the Unbreathable. The unbreathable squirrel girl. Let's see if I can find one for you. Here, I'll, I'll share my screen real quick so I can show you what Manny is working on. He is he is an artist and he is working on his own comic book project. We'll take a we'll take a quick look at that. I don't know if that's large enough to see. See if I click on it, will it get larger for us? A little bit. Yeah, so Manny, Manny is a fellow, a fellow member, a fellow citizen of the Aloha State. So uh, Manny is good dog press in our audience there. And that's the project he's working on. The unbreathable skunk girl. All right. Let's get back into the text. <laughs> Get a little bit more Seneca here. All right, this is sectional. This is section 14. And it says, it is impossible, says Theophrastus, for a good man not to be angry with bad men. By this reasoning, the better a man is, the more irascible he will be. Yet will he not rather be more tranquil, more free from passions, and hating no one? Indeed, what reason has he for hating sinners, since it is error that leads them into such crimes? Now it does not become a sensible man to hate the erring, since if so, he will hate himself. Let him think now how many things he does contrary to good morals, how much of what he has done stands of need in pardon, and he will soon become angry with himself also. For no righteous judge pronounces a different judgment in his own case and that of others. No one, I affirm, will be found who can acquit himself. Everyone, when he calls himself innocent, everyone, when he calls himself innocence, looks rather to external witnesses than to his own conscience. How much more philanthropic, how much more philanthropic is it to deal with the erring in a gentle and fatherly spirit? and to call them into the right counsel instead of hunting them down. When a man is wandering about our fields because he has lost his way, it is better to place him on the right path than to drive him away. All right, one more time for emphasis. It is impossible, says the Theophrastus, for a good man not to be angry with bad men. By this reasoning, the better a man is, the more irascible he will be. Yet will he not rather be more tranquil, more free from passions, and hating no one? Indeed, what reason has he for hating sinners, since it is error? that leads them into such crimes. Now, it does not become a sensible man to hate the erring, 
since if so, he will hate himself. Let him think, let him think how many things he himself does contrary to good morals. How much of what he has done stands in need of pardon, and he will soon become angry with himself also. For no righteous judge pronounces a different judgment in his own case and that of others. No one, I affirm, will be found who can acquit himself. Everyone, when he calls himself innocent, looks rather to external witnesses than to his own conscience. How much more philanthropic is it to deal with the erring in a gentle and fatherly spirit and call them into the right course instead of hunting them down? When a man is wandering about our fields because he has lost his way, it is better to place him on the right path than to drive him away. <laughs> Section 14 of Seneca's on Anger. We wet the whistle and say hello to some people who may have come in. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, isn't Tuesday's High Councils? I'm not sure. Today is Tuesday, right? I'm pretty sure Wednesday is, is drawn and quartered. Okay, so people, people in the audience are asking me about some particular programs that are coming on. I should always remember to preface when I'm talking to the, um, when I'm talking to the audience. And some of them are asking me when, when certain YouTube programs come on. Uh, Wednesday night is, is drawn and quartered. Let's see, Contrarian420, Contrarian420 in the chat says, one of my favorite Seneca quotes, our alarms are much more numerous than our dangers, and we, su we suffer much oftener in imagination than reality. <laughs> yes, sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the idea of a thing is much worse than the thing itself. All right, We've got a few more people came in here. Again, we said hello to Contrary in 420. Model 3, 316 is modding it up tonight. P.S. Melter says, uh, I'm in restart of my comic. I hope you're having a great day. I am. Thank you, brother. Uh, DJ Quad, I hope you're doing well. Let's see. Contrarian says there's also a similar uh, Epictetus quote. I would imagine it is. That's probably, is that from the discourses or from the... Um, oh, I always mispronounce it. In Karadian. In, not in Karadian, but the uh, in Karadian. Let's see. A guide on finding a man who has lost his way, brings him back to the right path. He does not, he does not mock and jeer at him and then take himself off. You must, you also must show the unlearned man the truth and you will see that he will follow. But so long as you do not show it him, you should not mock, but rather feel your own capacity, incapacity. Yeah, I like that. And that's from the golden sayings of, of Epictetus. Durakin says, I'm not really listening. You are acting as background noise. All right. Well, I will attempt to provide you the very finest in background noise. <laughs> oh. let, me, uh, let me read one section, and then I need to take about a two-minute break. Let's see. This is section 15. It says, the sinner, therefore... The sinner ought, therefore, to be corrected both by warning and by force, both by gentle and harsh means, and may be made a better man both towards himself 
and others by chastisement, but not by anger. For who is angry with the patient whose wounds he is tending? <laughs> but they cannot be corrected, and there is nothing in them that is gentle or that admits of good hope. Then let them be removed from mortal society. If they are likely to deprave everyone with whom they come in contact and let them cease to be mad men in the only way in which they can, yet let this be done without hatred, for what reason have I for hating the man to whom I am doing the greatest good, since I am rescuing him from myself? Does a man hate his own limbs when he cuts them off? That is not an act of anger, but a lamentable method of healing. We knock mad dogs on the head. We slaughter fierce and savage bulls. And we doom scabby sheep to the knife. <laughs> Man, don't be a scabby sheep, lest they should infect our flocks. We destroy monstrous births. Oh, now he's getting a little harsh here. And we also drown our children if they are born weakly or unnaturally formed. To separate what is useless from what is sound is an act, not of anger, but of reason. Nothing becomes one who inflicts punishment less than anger. Because the punishment has all the power to work reformation if the sentence be pronounced with deliberate judgment. This is why Socrates said to the slave, I would strike you were I not angry. He put off the correction of the slave to a calmer season. At the moment, he corrected himself. Who can boast that he has his passions under his control when Socrates did not dare trust did not dare to trust himself to his anger. Let me uh, let me stretch my feet, and then we'll come back to this one because that was a uh, that was a bit of a doozy. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a doozy. Let's see. Dracon says, "I believe," and again, I'm referencing the chant. Dracon says, "I believe it was Aristotle who said, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball." Ah, yeah, maybe. Maybe was that in the uh, the wrenchitus? <laughs> I may be a little bit skeptical of that. I will be right back. Boy, since we have such a uh, since we have such a small group, I am tempted I am tempted to take you out on my balcony so you can see Pearl Harbor. Um, the only trade-off would be you could see a sunset over Pearl Harbor. You see, you can see a sunset over Pearl Harbor, but there would be a lot of background noise. 
Would you would you like to see that? Let me know in chat. One, if you would like to uh, see a Pearl Harbor sunset, uh, knowing that you're going to get a little bit of background noise. Or two, if you want me to just stay here and continue on with Seneca. Since we have such a small, intimate group, I am more than happy, more than happy to accommodate. Okay, you want to see? Okay. Give me just just a moment then. I'm going to turn my camera off for just a moment while I move everything around, and I will be right back with you, okay? One and two. Yeah, we'll continue the Seneca. There just might be a little bit of background noise, all right? So bear with me for a moment. Here with me, gentlemen. Let's see. Let's get a restart. This is Pearl Harbor. In fact, I'm going to give you, I'm just going to pan around and show you show you everything I can see from my we, uh, we have a very very amazing view I'm very blessed and the sun is approximately That island, that island is Ford Island. Oh, I see what it is. It's <laughs> my camera's my camera's flipped around. It's mirrored. That's what's throwing me off. Give me just a moment to straighten out the view. All right, if you look right there. That is the Arizona Memorial. Oops. Just one more moment, and we'll be set. you can hear me now. There is going to be some, uh, there is going to be some background noise. Uh, I can't, I can't help that. Let me see if I can kind of show you. 
I'm sitting here. Go back to my camera. All right. This this island right here is called Ford Island. And right off the tip of the island is the Arizona Memorial. Right there. It's the Arizona Memorial. If you look, you can see a plane kind of landing on the horizon. Hopefully this won't get too irritating. There is quite a bit of background noise. Yeah, I thought you might I thought you might enjoy this. Let me see if we can catch a little bit more of the sunset. Just a little bit more. I'll figure this out in the future. I suppose if I get a longer cable, I could still be inside, and then you wouldn't you wouldn't get on the background noise. You can you can hear pretty much everything here. <laughs> Oh, it looks like the uh, Magnum PI helicopter. That's funny. <laughs> too funny. Let me know if this if this becomes too distracting. Okay. And let me know if my voice is too drowned out. We'll read a few more passages. Read a few more passages, for example. This is passage 16. We do not, therefore need an angry chastiser to punish the erring and wicked. For since anger is a crime of the mind, it is not right that sins should be punished by sin. What? Am I not to be angry with a robber or a poisoner? <laughs> or the guy hulk at his horn? No, for I am, I am not angry with myself when I bleed myself. I apply all kinds of punishment as remedies. You are as yet only in the first stage of error, and do not go wrong seriously. Although you do so often, then I will try to amend you by a reprimand, given first in private, then in public. You again have gone too far to be restored to virtue by words alone, you must be kept in order by disgrace. For the next, some stronger measure is required. Something that he can feel must be branded upon him. You, sir, shall be sent into exile and to a desert place. The next man's thorough villainy needs harsher remedies. Chains and public imprisonment must be applied to him. You, lastly, have an incurably vicious mind and add crime to crime. You have come to such a past that you are not influenced by the arguments that are never wanting to recommend evil. That sin itself is to you a sufficient reason for sinning. You have so steeped your heart in wickedness that wickedness cannot be taken from you without bringing your heart with it. Wretched man, you have long sought to die. We will do you good service. We will take away that madness from which you suffer. And to you, and to you who have so long lived a misery to yourself and to others, we will give the only good thing which remains. That is death. Death. <laughs> wow. He just took it to another level. Took it to another level. All right. But not with anger. You see, a bug and a flea says Fort Island was where the tower Ben Affleck flew past chasing zeros was in the movie. Yeah. Oh, wow. You can see the rain that it may be a little, let's see, I don't know if you'll be able to see that or not, we can kind of see the rain coming in. 
I wonder if I can down the color up a little bit so you can see. Maybe I can down the brightness up. It'll give you a, a better chance to experience what I'm seeing. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for all the noise. But I wanted you to be able to see some of this. Give it some more color intensity. Give it some more color intensity and make it brighter. Brighter. Hopefully this is not too much. <laughs> Let us see. Yeah, that's that's a little bit more of what I'm seeing. Oh, it's so noisy out here. I bet you every bit of this noise. I bet you every bit of this noise is coming through. And just the sun was so pretty. The sunset was so pretty. I wanted to, I wanted to be able to share it with you. The rain is slowly starting to make its way out. So just a little bit of a short one tonight. What uh, what do you think of Seneca? Should we examine some more of Seneca in the future after we finish after we finish up the meditations by Marcus Aurelius? And I quite enjoyed that. I don't think I had ever read on anger before. If I have, it's it's been so long that I just do not recall much of it. <laughs> Yeah, let me know what you think, and perhaps we will do we will do some more of that. But for now, uh, for now, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, he's got he's got some different he's got some different ideas. I, I do want to bring uh, I do want to bring meditations to a close first. But yeah, I think I, I think Seneca has an interesting voice. How about C.S. Lewis as well sometime in the future? Well, what are you thinking? Are you thinking about the, the screw tape letter or, or what were you thinking about it? Because C.S. Lewis has a very interesting voice himself. And I think I think that's public domain now, so we should be able to read from that without getting into too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to I'll have to check on that. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you be now. I'm gonna I'm gonna start on dinner. I'm gonna get dinner going for myself and my wife a little bit early. I hope to be on Mike Miller tonight uh, with the Aloha Hour. So hopefully you will see me there. But probably about the same time tomorrow, uh, I'll pick this up and we'll um, we'll probably do uh, tomorrow. We'll probably be back to uh, Marcus Aurelius and meditations. Um, Thanksgiving Day, Thanksgiving Day, it's kind of a tradition for my wife and I to, uh, we, we have been doing it on Facebook before now, but this year we're going to do it on YouTube. We're actually going to stream us cooking the dinner. We usually, not, not the eating of the dinner, but as we're cooking, we usually stream that for our family so they can watch along with us. And so we will probably... We'll probably put that on YouTube on Thanksgiving. And so if you're if you're bored and want to see how the boy ends cook on Thanksgiving, you are also more than welcome to join us. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your good intentions and your attention and your feedback in the conversation. I appreciate it very much. Aloha and good night.